still interested after this this lecture. Um, okay. Uh, the the um, the the. The contrast I'm seeking to make um, is really a contrast uh, between um, uh, a set of documents that human rights is often seen as a set of uh, um, documents that uh, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that everyone uh, feels are a good thing. Um, but to pose the question, does this actually uh, enable uh, the struggle for, for, for emancipation? I'd, I'd like to pose, start with, with um, just going historically to, to the, the period of the enlightenment, the European enlightenment, um, which gave birth to liberalism. Um, but liberalism itself has always been uh, a, um, a conjoined twin of racism. Um, and the democracy that emerged from liberalism uh, was, has always been uh, an exclusivist project. Um, if, if one looks at the, the birth of uh, modern uh, democracy in the United States, uh, at its origins, only white male slave owners were uh, enfranchised to vote. Um, and what liberalism and the ideology of liberalism uh, gave, uh, gave birth to was the creation of two quite separate zones. Um, the sacred zone, um, and this is really taken from uh, Domenico Losordo's book, um, Liberalism, A Counter History. Um, a sacred zone which comprised people who were considered themselves to be the epitome of being human uh, and subsequently uh, um, being as the civilized people. Uh, and the sac in contrast, the sacrifice zone were those who were considered non-human or less than civilized or, or subsequently uh, underdeveloped. Um, and, and it divided the, the society up in, in, you know, within uh, when the, the early birth of, of democracy in the US. So I said, even, even the wives of white slave owners were not allowed to vote. So, so even within the so-called sacred space, there, were, there was uh, a separation uh, of those who were considered uh, sufficiently human and those who were less than uh, human. And, and I think this has been a, a fundamental feature of, of capitalism uh, and, and its expansion uh, into uh, the realms of uh, enslavement, slavery, colonization, uh, and what to today called globalization, which is just an expansion of the uh, colonial project, the imperial project. Um, and it's fundamentally based, I would argue, on dividing the world uh, um, of, into those who are part of the sacred zone and those who are, um, are considered to be uh, in the sacrificial zones. My difficulty with, with the, the, the human rights discourse, um, and, and just, just to let you know that you know, I spent uh, a few years 
as the Africa director of Amnesty International. Um, and so uh, a lot of my thinking came out of uh, the, the struggles that, that we had in, uh, in, um, in Amnesty. And, and it boils down to, uh, I think, um, the, the absence of, um, of any emancipatory project within that, uh, that discourse. Um, and and, it, and it, it does seem to me that uh, that is a rather serious uh, o o omission. Um, that much of the discourse it has, is based on an inability to transcend uh, descriptive uh, uh, and, and a given uh, situation. Um, it's, in a sense, leads to a certain depoliticization uh, uh, of uh, struggles of those in the in the sacrifice zones, the wretched of the earth, les damnés de la terre, and and therein lies uh, a contrast in the way in which the discourse is currently held, is the the, the separation or the counterposition between representation and presentation. That is to say, the human rights lobbies uh, seek to represent the uh, the the damne de la terre uh, and rarely uh, seeks to enable the presentation by them they themselves those from the sacrifice zone to to discuss and, and present their own um, experiences so so I, I feel that there is a sort of uh, need to 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 rethink um, uh, on on what we we actually mean by by human rights, um, you know, to what extent can it be a framework uh, for social change? I think the fundamental problem we have with with uh, the human rights discourse is that the the, mo the those who are most uh, those who violate uh, human rights so extensively are are the state. The, the state is the is the the the, the most um, frequent violator of human rights, and yet the discourse around human rights is an appeal to the state. Uh, in other words, it's saying uh, that it's like saying, uh, well, um, we'll ask the criminal to judge whether something is, uh, is wrong. Um, and I think there is a problem here because uh, it accepts that the state uh, is part of uh, the, the, the discourse, which means that human rights movements are in a sense uh, part of uh, the, 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 the state. And you have this sort of contrast between uh, subjecthood and, and victimhood. Um, the, the production of authentic victims or, or, or victim authenticity is a, I mean, it's been essentially a voyeuristic or pornograph pornographic practice that no matter how carefully or sensitively it is done, transforms the position of the victim in his or her society and produces a language of victimization for him to or her to speak uh, on the international stage. So, so, so like much of the NGOs, uh, the non-governmental organizations, the human rights organizations need victims. They, they, they cannot fulfill their function. They cannot work without having victims. And so in a sense, they, 
their work is about victimization, the, the creation of victims. Uh, and, um, and I think that's, that's the source of its um, depoliticizing of, uh, of uh, movements, uh, which is reduced to um, uh, appealing to the state, the violator, uh, to um, provide justice, so-called, uh, to that. Um, I mean, it's fair enough. I mean, human rights have originally been about the limits of uh, on state control, um, but it but it tends not to engage with the politics of a situation of of the popular struggles that uh, take place, the, the struggles for democratization. Um, words like emancipation uh, it, are, are, are not part of the, uh, um, uh, the, the discourse, the language of human rights. Um, and, and it doesn't really engage in, in, in that um, discourse from, a, from an emancipatory perspective. It, and, and, and that's not about subjects bearing rights conferred by the state, but rather about people who think about, think and who can, who becoming agents through their own engagement in politics as militants, as activists, and not merely as formal uh, polit politicians. I, I think that, that that whole approach uh, has been about disabling political thought. Often it's technicist. People are interpolated by the state as, as legal, not political subjects. Uh, it's moral um, and, and it's interpolated by power as victims uh, not as political subjects. Um, it's very focused on the state and asking that criminal state to adjudicate its own actions. Um, and as part of civil society, it, it's, uh, its discourse is fundamentally about the depoliticization uh, of struggles. Uh, and remaining uh, essentially state oriented as uh, um, and seeking recognition uh, from the state, which seeking legitimacy from the very state that is uh, that is responsible for uh, um, for the carrying out of uh, human rights abuses. But of course, you know, that's not to say that uh, it is a dismissal of the ideas of um, human rights. But there, there is an option. There's, there's on the one hand to see uh, human rights uh, only as legal claims as derived from a series of legal documents uh, or the alternative is, as Issa Shivji, uh, the Tanzanian professor, uh, has put it, and that is to see the, the claim for rights being uh, like a flag around which the oppressed organize uh, to claim uh, their, their, their rights. I think the other aspect of um, of hum the human rights discourse uh, is fundamentally, I'd argue, uh, it's fundamentally a Eurocentric definition. Um, I mean, one illustration of, of this is that at the time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was formulated and signed, 
two thirds of the world was still under colonial rule. None of those and engaged in the struggle against colonialism itself were signatories to that original document. Um, and, and it is silent about the history of European domination, uh, the colonial uh, uh, period. The, the Universal Declaration has its origins uh, in uh, the Second World War and the period of 1930s and 40s was the rise of Nazism in, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and that gave the inspiration for the proclamation of a uh, set of uh, um, aspirations that are described in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the, the, the problem we, we, we face is that because of the silence on the histories, what the shock that led to the um, establishment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was because what was carried out by fascism in Europe was something that was the norm of colonial rule in its entire history. That is to say that the fascistic practices which were carried out by empire in the colonies, in the genocides that it carried out, for example, in the North, in the Americas, uh, and indeed in parts of Africa, the mass killings, the whole massive land grabs, the whole uh, method of colonial rule uh, was was a system which was brought to Europe by the Nazis. And the shock and horror of the establishment was not so much on the practices itself, but as Aimé Césaire points out, it is about the audacity to bring this to the white world, to the European world. Uh, and, and therein lies this fundamental uh, hypocrisy. Um, and by eliminating any concern for the historical situation, the, how situations have arisen, what has happened, who have in fact been the ones carrying out uh, human rights violations, by silencing that, the, it leaves leaves a it results in a in a depoliticization. It re results in erasing uh, the causes uh, of uh, of the human rights violations. And without history, uh, then we we have no way of conceptualizing what the future. Uh, might look like. So my critique about this is to say, well, perhaps we should be looking at this from a different angle. If, if one understands that the whole history of liberalism has been to create different zones, the sacrifice and the sacred zones, and those in the sacred decide who is considered to be human or or, and who is to be considered less than human and therefore not uh, uh, subject to, uh, to the right to, to human rights. Uh, if one thinks about it in, in those terms, then, then we, we have to ask, well, actually, who has the right uh, to rights? One very good example from South Africa has been that when, and it's true in Kenya and many other places, when the police wish to search somebody's house in the sacred zone, in the marks the middle classes and the uh, allies of the oligarchs, in order to search a house, they need to produce a uh, search warrant authorized by the state and its judiciary. 
But when the police want to search the house of the living quarters of those who are in the ghettos or in the rural areas, they simply kick the doors down. They simply smash the whole place up. They, they will wound, injure, and often kill people in the process uh, without any, in most cases, without any, uh, with, with complete impunity, with, without any recourse to any uh, justice. So what you have here is this contrast between those who have the right to rights, that is those who occupy uh, the sacred zones, and those who are the majority who live in the, in the sacrificial zones, who don't have the right to, to rights. So the question is how to resolve this, this issue. And, and, and what we see in every attempt to, to confine uh, populations, and confine people into the uh, sacrificial zones is a response, not necessarily immediate. Sometimes it takes a while for it to emerge. But what one sees is a, uh, a response which is a fundamentally a proclamation that uh, a proclamation of humanity that we are human, and and indeed goes further than that. Than that. In many cases, uh, not merely proclaiming that we are we too are human but actually inventing what it means to be human uh, and transforming uh, that understanding of, of what humanity is about. And in many cases, what you see is not merely a, um, that proclamation, but uh, a, a move towards a universalist, view, rather than saying, we in the sacrifice zones, we demand this X, Y, and Z. Their response is, humanity should not be like this, that, that what is being done is wrong, and that the existence of these two zones is irresponsible, and a recognition that those who seek to dehumanize others become dehumanized themselves. Uh, and, and I think that's the, 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 the issue that uh, em emerges because what you then have is that those who consider themselves to be part of that, that sacred zone have become dehumanized. They will kill with impunity that we have seen uh, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Somali, Libya, and so on, uh, mass killings with complete impunity. What's been shocking recently is how in the US, with the withdrawal of the US from, uh, from Afghanistan, there have been long uh, listing of all those people by name, who died in the Twin Towers, but not one mention, not one name, not one this complete erasure of any history of those who were massacred by America and by its allies in uh, Afghanistan or indeed in, uh, in, in Iraq, in Somalia, in Libya and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I think it's a good illustration of, of how these acts of brutality, these acts of considering others disposable is an act that dehumanizes. And, and so it really comes back to this thing is that often the, the, the struggles of civil society organization is a claim for equality, uh, equal rights. 
But the reality is, I don't think any of us want to become equal to the, the dehumanized rulers of the, of the uh, sacred zone. And, and I think that the human rights uh, discourse is part of the ideological, um, to use Gramsci's word, of, of a process of political hegemony uh, that is used to, to neuter the struggles that happen uh, of those in the sacrificial zones who are claiming, proclaiming humanity. Uh, and, and therein, I think, lies uh, a serious problem with, with that uh, discourse. Um, let me stop there to allow uh, then uh, some discussions amongst uh, yourselves. Uh, and um, thank you. Please feel free. I thank you so much, um, Dr. Menji. And actually, Carnelie has just joined us. Are you, Carnelie, are you in South Africa or in Zimbabwe? Okay, well, um, we'll have Carnelie come on uh, as, he, as he joins. Um, yeah, so well, thank you so much for that. It's very provocative. I think it's, um, it certainly brushes against the grain of how we're taught what human rights are about, the history and so on. And I wonder if anybody has any responses to that. They want to come in and ask Dr. Manji some questions. There's Taylor who's come on with our video in Iowa. There's Rosemary in, in Pittsburgh. Go ahead. Uh, Taylor, it looks like you're muted. If you want to just, yeah, there oh, you go. Oh, I wasn't actually raising my hand, I, but I, you know, if no one else is going to say anything right now, <laughs> it, I happily will. Um, Let's continue. Oh, so delighted to join you. Um, thank you for speaking with us. Uh, so much of what you said, uh, this is not like my field of expertise, um, but so much of what you said really, uh, resonated in um, how you seem to be highlighting two sides of the ways that um, like the individual and the state function or don't function. And I guess I just, my question for you um, was with your extensive experience and obviously the 